We're looking at Shakespeare's uh, Measure for Measure. Uh, this is the fourth and final lecture on the class. And you'll recall that at the outset, I noted that the title is taken from Matthew 7 verses 1 and 2. So judge not lest you be judged, for with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, it shall be measured to you again. So there's a sense of reciprocity and justice. And this is interesting, even in the uh, Sermon on, on the Mount, and it's uh, the, this uh, very dictum of justice suggests a reciprocity and, a, and uh, also a, uh, an awareness of the need for the judge to be aware of his own sinful nature or lack thereof in the case of Christ. Christ is the fit judge because of, of course he is not only sinless, but also uh, he uh, knows what it's like to be a human being. So he's compassionate in his judgment. Uh, and also, as we know, uh, gave himself up to uh, judgment, not for his own sins, but for the sins of humanity, which were laid upon his shoulders. And he bore the wrath of God, which we in our, uh, sinfulness deserved so and that was considered an act of grace now he laid down his life for his not his friends but even his enemies and so this is the demonstration of love it's also an illustration of grace that's the title of the play however and the play as we've seen is uh, connected <coughs> with a city uh, Vienna which has been allowed to go to sea not because of the grace of its ruler but rather his laxity in enforcing the law. And so what is clear from the outset is that grace does not entail a lack of judgment, but rather a correct implementation of judgment and the uh, enforcement of the law. And I talked about the three functions of the law to that end. And, the, and one of them was the, um, uh, the law as an instructor and that points to Christ. And the need for mercy, that's the thing, that's what the justice system ultimately does. It doesn't just restrain sin, which was the first function. Because, of course, sin can even, uh, as we see in the play, sin is a problem in and of itself, but it creates more sin, which is maybe the worst aspect of sin. More sin results from it, and it just, the, the depravity uh, doesn't seem to have a bottom. But at the same time, the second function of the law is to point at, to Christ as a pedagogue, as a teacher. And the need and who is Christ he is the judge but also he is the one who is merciful and that function of the law has also been defrauded by the Duke's unwillingness to use the law of Vienna to curb the weeds that are headstrong and the, the city has been overrun so it's like an unweeded garden that metaphor of gardening which is there throughout scripture all the way back from the beginning the Garden of Eden uh, he is not fulfilled his mandate as a uh, child of Adam. He has not exercised dominion over his kingdom. And now we have the consequences of it. And he has brought in, just to re recapitulate, he's brought in this young man, Claudio, who is renowned for his severe disposition and for his virtue. At least he's, he's renowned for this. Uh, so much so that others see him for this. But the Duke has clearly got suspicions about that. He's not yet been tested, and he brings him in to do precisely that, to test him. And so I said, so this is the Duke uh, effectively functioning as a surrogate for the uh, playwright, namely Shakespeare. And who is the audience upon whom the playwright is playing? It's not the actors per se, it's the audience. So the dramatist is testing the audience, even who is watching the play, letting them think through the various aspects of sin and law and judgment and grace and see the varying uh, angles from different characters, some who function as foils for another, and to try and teach them and point to the need for mercy themselves because they too will be judged for the very sins for which Claudio has been condemned to death. And as we've seen at this point, Angelo is also guilty, but at, up to this point, 
has not been brought to any sort of public judgment for it, but he will be, or at least he might be if the Duke is effective, and we're going to see he will be effective uh, in the rest of the play. But we are, uh, don't forget Shakespeare has an audience here in mind, and the audience is not only being entertained, the audience is being instructed and pointed to the mercies of Christ themselves. And at the same time, the need for the third function of the law, which is there for that, a normative function to allow them to orientate their lives so that they can live lives pleasing to God. That's what the law is there for. And, and, and I said to you, the assumption in Sha for Shakespeare and all of these things is that the laws of the state are in accordance with Christ and his character. The whole justice system in Shakespeare's day, that is the underlying assumption. It is no longer an assumption that we can make. This is where we differ in the come the 19th century and certainly since the 1960s, our justice system has departed from the common law tradition which was rooted in the Ten Commandments, uh, even explicitly so, according to a, a, a hermeneutics of jurisprudence called the living tree. If you've never heard of this, just look it up sometime. It's the, a way of reading the law such that we are not constrained by past judgments, but rather can move the law in dire directions that are only unprecedented, but even contrary to previous judgments that have been given and, and actually contrary to the, to the law as it stands. To use the Latin phrase, stare decisis. So d judgments that have been given and are therefore standing law upon which we ought to be guided are now seen as things that don't constrain the, the judge. And so our legal system ha has departed from the law as it was bequeathed to us and is now in some ways in flat contradiction to it. Not wholly, but in, in new legislation that is often the case. I need to say that because uh, Shakespeare's assumptions about the law, we would have to look at them a little differently. We live in a more complex world than Shakespeare does in some ways. But the, so the law there is to promote and seek the happiness of human beings. Remember, it's not there to punish people, ultimately. In order to achieve the happiness of human beings, their blessedness, it must punish people. When they transgress, they commit criminal acts, which are rooted in sin. When it does that, then it has to, do, has to correct that. Otherwise, it doesn't actually hold that there's a good and an evil. It will say that they're equivalent. That's a relativistic viewpoint. Well, you can sin or you can do the right thing and we will treat those two things with equality. Well, that's just suggesting that there's no difference between good and evil. Or to use Satan's language in uh, Paradise Lost, evil be thou my good. That's not Shakespeare's view. Uh, it shouldn't be our view either. But the, the issue, and here's the difference between civil law and God's law, in civil law, there's an awareness that the law cannot do what is needed to fix people. And there's an awareness that even in the judgment of people, even when they're condemned to death, as Claudio is, they still have the opportunity to repent and ask for God's grace and be forgiven before the ultimate judge, namely Christ. And their sins can be forgiven, even if they're going to be executed. They, they plead for mercy, confess their sins, and they can be received into the kingdom of heaven. And that's one of the issues about Claudio's edict there is he wants no mercy. He sees himself as the final judge, the last judge, the ultimate judge. There is, and therefore, he, he can bring in the edict of uh, the death sentence and not allow time for him to repent. This is monstrous. He's, he's taking upon himself powers that he ought not to. He, so he doesn't understand that he himself is under God's judgment. And he will be for this act. So governors and, uh, are themselves subject to the law. They're not above the law. And, but he's acting as if he is. He's acting as if he were a sinless man. He's acting as if he were God himself. And that's uh, one of the uh, great lessons here about judgmentalism. It allows for no mercy not even God's mercy. So Angelo, who scarce confesses that his blood flows or that his appetite is more to bread than stone, 
fails to cultivate this awareness in himself that he himself is liable to judgment and there but for the grace of God, he would be in Claudio's position under judgment. He doesn't seem to be aware of this about himself because remember, after all, he had not at this point even committed the sin with his fiance. He, he had not slept with his fiance, but he's about to do so, except that it, he won't know that it's his fiance. He'll think that it's Isabella. So it's the so-called the bed trick. This is one of the things for which uh, the Duke is sometimes accused of being Machiavellian. He's, he's being duplicitous and tricking Angelo into committing uh, a sinful offense. But remember, the sinful intent was there. It's just that there was a different object that received the consequences of that intent than he intended. The sin remained the same. And again, for Shakespeare's purposes, these dramas that he presents are not there to recapitulate a historical event. They are to give moral instruction to his audience. It's to teach his audience to live better lives, to uh, understand the nature of God's justice and mercy, and to go out and do likewise. That's the point of it. And that's why it concludes with either a tragedy or a comedy. There's always a tight conclusion. Just, or injustice is punished. The dead or the, uh, the, the bad guys are having we effectively executed and there's a total uh, realignment that way or it's rectified in a comic way through marriages. But there's, there's a unity and a justice that's come out of the uh, initial injustice. So Shakespeare believes in a ordered world and he presents that in his plays and I think this is ever so important in literature and in uh, artistic depictions, that the audience believes that there is justice and it is done in the work itself. It's not left open-ended. So if there are bad guys, they, they need to be punished in the works. They need to be seen to be punished. Otherwise, it suggests that evil, there is no judgment upon evil. That's the, that's the takeaway lesson or that goodness is not rewarded. Now, we all know that in this life, there are times when it seems like goodness is not rewarded. It's overlooked. This is a problem, uh, and it has been a problem recognized uh, from of old. It's uh, the Old Testament. Psalmists speak of it all the time. You know, why is it the unrighteous seem to flourish? Why is this so? It's a real problem. This is one of the, one of the problems of evil, I guess, is that the unrighteous seem to flourish, whereas the saints uh, are oppressed. Uh, oppressed, depressed, marginalized, seemingly without any help. Right? That's uh, how many Psalms are written with that in mind. And, and the narratives in the Old Testament where the prophets are actually being persecuted for doing nothing other than uh, trying to call people to account. And in fact, that's the witness of the Old Testament. This is what happened to the prophets. They were persecuted, ignored, and ultimately killed. And now Jesus comes forward and the same thing happens to him. And if he says it happens to me, it will also happen to you. So all of those things need to be weighed, weighed in balance here. But he has, um, as this, Angelo has scarce confessed that he has appetites. And then he met this girl, Isabella, a, a woman renowned for virtue who's going to go into a nunnery. And that seemed to awaken him this lust for a woman that he never even knew he had the capacity for. And so what we find is that he has not really got the virtue for which he is um, praised. He's never cultivated. He's never been tested. He's never been tried. He's been given no trials in life. So why is he renowned for virtue? I don't know. Maybe he was in it from a privileged background. Um, but he's revealed what uh, all of us will know if we live for any time. We have, we have feet of clay. There's a sinner in each one of us, and all of us will fall given the right circumstances. And now he has fallen. Yes, for it. Which is why in... in Assume he has, like, 
Right. And, and to his own knowledge, he even has that character. Now, it's interesting from the outset, the judgment of other characters is that he is just uh, virtue signaling Angelo, right? That, that he's using this. So, for example, he's going to execute Claudio. He's going to make a, an example of him to show that he is the tough guy, right? But uh, he's only going to do it there, but he's not consistent in that. He's not going to do that uh, elsewhere, and we see that it is the case. He's not willing to... Act, he's not willing to execute the, the prostitutes and the, the madams and the runners. He's going to leave them alone, but he's going to go after Claudio. So the, 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 the contradiction there is obvious, and he is, in fact, just making an example of him. And now he's going to be made an example of. But again, my point here in the play is exactly what you just said, which is that this play is teaching us something about human nature. It's not just about the individuals here. It's holding the mirror up to nature as to her to show her her true self. And whose nature is that? It's your nature and it's my nature. That's what the mirror is being held up to. And Shakespeare is showing us what we would do were we in that position or what we could do. And there's a reason why in, in scripture, uh, an elder is uh, to be an older man. And that's why he's been tested by life. A presbyteros is an old man. That's what it is, a presbyter. Um, and it's not because of the age per se. It's because of what you've, exactly what you've des uh, described. It's the experience of being tried and found worthy of the test. And he's not there yet. Now, what it leads Angelo to is a terrific, and I'll say this as somebody who was once young, no longer so, when you're young, you have a terrific eagle eye for hypocrisy. Because I was sharp and keen sighted in hypocrisy of others until I got into my mid 20s. And then I realized, because by that point, I'd had sufficient time to be like Angelo, that I too was a sinner. And I too, therefore, was a hypocrite because I condemned in others what I myself was able to do and had, in fact, done. So, important moment for me in my life. Yes? It reminds me of, like, when people said, look at a situation that someone's going through and say, well, I could do that better. And Which is possible. Me, especially reminds me of um, all of the neo-Marxists today that say, oh, no, Are no, you no, trying no, to bait me? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the reason why communism has failed is nobody's ever really done it right. full on, and if they'd been faithful to it, then it would succeed. It kind of just reminds me of that. Yeah. Like, like Shakespeare's trying to say, yeah, you think you can do better in said situation, but let's actually put yourself in that situation and see how it happens. Yes, you're, you're correct. And so the Marxist account of human nature and the problem just simply doesn't go deep enough. He thinks it's due to uh, economic deprivation. So if the workers had the means of production and they had the wealth, then they would not do these things. So do we avoid the problem of social injustice by giving the poor wealth and taking the wealth from the rich? And that will solve the inequalities which are the basis of injustice. Why people say Marx didn't truly understand he didn't understand human nature. And he didn't understand that actually what he's describing uh, as injustice could just as easily be described as envy, desiring your neighbor's wealth, and often is rooted in that, which isn't to say that the rich don't treat the poor badly. That's also borne witness to in scripture. But the remedy of leveling out things by equally distributing wealth doesn't get rid of the sin problem. It doesn't go deep enough. That, one, that problem descends all the way to the root of the human heart. And that's what this play is about. So there's a, a man who is renowned for virtue, placed in a position where he can now be as virtuous as he appears, and he fails pretty st uh, spectacularly. But you're, you're correct. Um, so we've had the point to uh, see various characters tested up to this point. We had the opportunity to see Claudio tested. Remember, the Duke went into him, talked about him, prepared him for, for death, be resolute for death. His uh, sister came in, also spoke to him, tested him. Uh, she herself 
uh, Isabella has been tested by the Duke, and he, she's going to continue to be tested, by the way, by the Duke in the background, putting her in situations where she is not, uh, there are no consequences for her action. She can do things out of the goodness of her heart because it's the good, because she loves the good, or because she's maybe, there's an advantage to it, to her for it. And remember, she's not a static character at the outset. It seems to me like the, one of the reasons she wants to go into the nunnery is not because she loves virtue, but because she's afraid of the vice in her and thinks that by going into the cloister, she will get away from the problem of sin. That's how she begins. Some people send their kids to Christian universities for that reason. If you go there, you're going to avoid the problem of sin. And not realizing the problem with that is the problem goes with you wherever. There's no escaping it because it's, it's, it's rooted in you. That's the problem. Otherwise, we could separate people on appearances. Those are the Christians. Those are the non-Christians. And so you gather all the good guys here and get rid of the bad. But that's a surface judgment. You can't see somebody as a Christian just by looking at them. You probably ought to have some sense by looking at them, but it's not quite so simple and straightforward as that, right? But in any event, uh, he, she has also been tested, and I think she's passed the test. There are other tests now taking place. One of them also will be Pompey. And another, uh, the other surrogate for the Duke, uh, whose name is Lucio, very much like Angelo. But the final figure, and I'll spend more time on him a little bit later on, but I'll, I'll get into the play first before we do that, is the Duke himself. So the surrogate for the playwright, in other words, Shakespeare, the man who's pulling the strings behind the scenes, is himself being looked upon by the audience, and he is being judged. Remember, he is under our scrutiny. We're, we're looking at his conduct as well. At the outset, it wasn't clear whether the Duke, by putting people in this position, was just being a Machiavellian. Right? He was just using people to hold on to his power, to create a certain outcome. But he didn't, what, where was his heart in all this? Did he really love the people? Or did he not just simply not want to be blamed? And did he want to be loved by the people? So he was going to bring in another guy to be the bad guy and then get rid of him, like Donald Trump did with that Scaramucci guy. Bring him in. He takes, okay, fired, 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 and then everyone's angry at Scaramucci and Trump comes along and say, okay, you're fired. And everyone says, woo, love it. I love that. That was a great thing. And I say, okay, so now Trump's taking care of four people. The three guys he wanted to fire and he let Scaramucci do it. And now he's got rid of Scaramucci. His hands are clean. Machiavellian. By the way, I'm not drawing a general portrait of President Trump. I'm just, that, that illustration uh, popped to mind when, I, when that happened. I thought that's a great illustration for what happens here in uh, politics often. Uh, but is the Duke like that? Because he is the most interesting character to me. He's very puzzling. So he allows it to happen. He retreats behind the scenes. He watches what happens. It seems to be as he would have predicted it to happen to some degree, at least with respect to uh, Angelo, because he thought he wasn't as virtuous as he appeared. Now he knows, because he had to test him first, but how about him? What, what's going on with, with him? What is he going to do with the characters that have run afoul? Now, there are a couple of instances here where there are people who are uh, given capital offenses, so they are condemned to die. Is he going to allow them to die without the possibility of repentance? Those are opportunities for the Duke himself. Uh, we'll come to those in a minute, but there are, there are executions of convicted murders. One of them was too drunk to make a confession. Will he allow him to be executed? He was guilty of the crime. The, the date and time of the execution was laid out in advance. He didn't pull the date forward, but at the same time, he was too drunk to confess to his sin and therefore receive the mercy of God. What is the Duke going to do? Is he going to let him die? He contemplates it, by the way. He considers whether he should do this. And in the end, he does not. He stays the execution. So the Duke is, himself is being judged by the audience, who is now 
had the opportunity to see many opportunities for judgment, many opportunities for mercy, many opportunities to wear virtuous character and action, and we ourselves are being taught and instructed in the nature of the law. Right? So it's measure for measure. This is Shakespeare, the, the Renaissance dramatist, using uh, the, the play to indirectly teach his pupils, who are the people who are paying to see his performance, which is not merely entertaining to them, but edifying to them, and teaching them something about God's uh, law and his grace. So I will look at him more uh, closely in a second, but let me go to that, back to Act 3. And uh, in scene 2, Lucio comes in, and it seems to me here that the Duke himself is being tested by Lucio, who shows his own hypocrisy by slandering the Duke. So Act 3, scene 2. And lines... So the Duke, the Duke is disguised. He comes in and converses with Lucio. And uh, I'll pick it up line 87 there. Lucio, what news, friar, of the Duke? I know none, says the Duke. Can you tell me of any? Some say he's with the emperor of Russia. Other, some, he is in Rome. But where he is? Where is he, think you? I know not where, but wheresoever I wish him well. Remember, this is the Duke disguised as a friar. Lucio, it, it was a mad, fantastical trick of him to steal from the state and usurp the beggary he was never born to. Lord Angelo dukes it well in his absence. He puts transgression to it. He actually does sin. The other one was merely a robber. He's a play on words here. The Duke, he does well in it. A little more lenity to lechery would do no harm in him. Something too crabbed that way, Friar. He's a little bit too uh, legalistic, and he's a little bit too virtuous for my liking. Whereas the Duke had not been, was his suggestion. So we'll carry on with this. It is too general a vice says the Duke, and severity must cure it. Lucio, yes, in good sooth. The vice is of a great kindred. It is well allied, but it is impossible to extirp it quite, friar, till eating and drinking be put down. So it's impossible, to, and this statement is a general maxim, it's impossible to stamp out uh, sin until we stop eating and drinking, because they go with human mortality until the second coming when sin is rid from the human condition. But they, here he goes, they say this Angelo was not made by man and woman after this downright ray of creation. Is it true, think you? <laughs> How should he be made then? Some report a sea maid spawned him, some that he was begot between two stockfishes. But it is certain that when he makes water his urine, is congealed ice. <laughs> that I know to be true. And he is a motion generative. That's infallible. You are pleasant, sir, and speak apace. Why, what a ruthless thing is this in him for the rebellion of a codpiece to take away the life of a man. Do you know what a codpiece is, by the way? In uh, uh, Elizabethan England, it's this ridiculous... I don't even know how to, it's like a, it's like a jock strap, outworn outside with lots of colors and sticking out in, it's the fashion. I'm surprised it's not the fashion again. I shouldn't have, yeah, maybe somebody's going to bring about a cod piece again. But that's effectively what it is. All for the rebellion of a cod piece. All for that to take away the life of a man. Would the Duke that is absent have done this? Ere he would have hanged a man for the getting a hundred bastards, he would have paid for the nursing a thousand. He had some feeling of the sport. He knew the service, and that instructed him to mercy. 
So now he's making a judgment on the Duke. Why did the Duke let so many people off? Because he was the greatest um, visitor of whorehouses himself. He had a taste for the sport, a feeling of the sport. Now the Duke, I never heard the absent Duke much detected for women. He was not inclined that way. Oh, sir, you are deceived. And the Duke, tis not possible. <laughs> it's, it's him, it's not possible. <coughs> Who? Not the Duke. Yes, your beggar of 50. And his use was to put a ducat in her clock dish. The Duke had crotchets in him. He had VD. He would be drunk too. And l that let me inform you. You do him wrong, surely. Sir, I was an inward of his. A shy fellow was the Duke, and I believe I know the cause of his withdrawing. What? I pray thee might be the cause. No pardon. Tis a secret must be locked within the teeth and the lips. But this I can let you understand. The greater file of the subject held the Duke to be wise. Wise? Why, no question but he was. Pfft. A very superficial, ignorant, unweighing fellow. Either this is envy in you, folly, or mistaking. The very stream of his life and the business he hath helmed must, upon a warranted need, give him a better proclamation. Let him be but testimonied in his own bringings forth, and he shall appear to the envious a scholar, a statesman, and a soldier. Therefore you speak unskillfully. Or if your knowledge be more, it is much darkened in your malice. Sir? I know him, and I love him. Love talks with better knowledge, and knowledge with dearer love. Come, sir, I know what I know. I can hardly believe that since you know not what you speak. But if the Duke, if ever the Duke return, as our prayers are he may, let me desire you to make your answer before him. If it be honest you have spoke, you have courage to maintain it. I am bound to call upon you, and I pray you your name. Sir, my name is Lucio, well known to the Duke. He shall know you better, sir, if I may live to report you. I fear you not. Okay, so he has been tested and found wanting. Condemn the Duke for uh, actions that the Duke he knows have not. He has not committed, and therefore he has been slandered infamously by this so-called nobleman, and therefore he will remember this when he judges him, but he's testing him. He's also being tested by him, because now the question is, how will the Duke deal with Lucio? He knows he's guilty of slander against the head of state, charging him with things that the Duke knows, because it's about him, that he is not committed. These are, these are treasonous charges in some ways. So the Duke is being tested by Lucio, who shows his hypocrisy by slandering him. And to some extent, it shows that he learns his lessons when he says this. Now, the Lucio, Lucio leaves the scene, and now the Duke's response to that exchange, 185. No might nor greatness in mortality can censure scape. Back wounding calumny the whitest virtue strikes. What king so strong can tie the gall up in the slanderous tongue? But who comes here? Now, what is the lesson he's learned? Well, at the outset, he didn't want to bring in the law because he feared his reputation would be struck. Now he finds out as good as he's been, he's still going to get slandered. There's no escape from it. He probably ought not to have put Angelo to the test. He ought to have stayed in his office and have brought the uh, anger of the people upon him for, for contradicting his previous actions. So he's learned his own lesson. So the, the, the teacher has been taught in this exchange. So I just draw that to your attention. But that doesn't mean the tragic potential has been undermined yet. Remember, Act 3 is the height of the tragic action, or it Will in, or, or it will lead to the tragic outcome in which the malefactors are punished, but it still could be a tragedy, and it looks like it might be. Because at the end of Act 3 and into Act 4, 
uh, where under the cover of darkness, Angelo and Marianna's tryst is being carried out in the so-called bad trick. Angelo, who believes he has slept with Isabella, breaks his vows and decides he's going to execute Claudio anyway. So not only does he sleep with who the, the woman he believes is uh, the chaste Isabella, he's going to break his vow to her and execute her brother anyway. So he's a scoundrel, double scoundrel. And now who's going to hold him accountable? So his sin has progressed yet further. He's being faithless to his own vow because now he has uh, contempt for even his own word. But the Duke, who, having seen this, is still operative, and this is our hope here. The Duke uh, continues on in his role as dramaturge figure. Angelo refuses to spare Claudio, and at this point, Act 4, Scene 2, the Duke must intervene to save him, and I'll pick it up there, Act 4, Scene 2. Act 4, Scene 2. Uh, line 62, Claudio enters, and the provost says, look, here's the warrant, Claudio, for thy death. Holds it up to him. Tis now dead midnight, and by eight tomorrow thou must be made immortal. Where is Barnardine? As fast locked up in sleep as guiltless labor when it lies starkly in the traveler's bones. He will not wake. Who can do good on him? Well, go prepare yourself, knocking within. But hark, what noise? So the criminal Barnardine is dead and will not be done good anymore. He's dead. So there's a new, hark, what noise? Heaven give your spirits comfort. Claudio goes out. By and by, I hope it is some pardon or reprieve for the most gentle Claudio. Now the Duke enters, disguised as the friar. Welcome, father, says the provost. And now the Duke. The best and wholesome spirits of the night envelop you, good provost. Who's who called here of late? None, since the curfew rung. Not Isabel? No. They will then ere it be long. What comfort is it for Claudio? There is some in hope. It is a bitter deputy. Not so, not so. His life is paralleled even with the stroke and line of his great justice. He doth with holy abstinence subdue that, that in himself which he spurs on his power to qualify in others. Were he mealed with that which he corrects, then were he tyrannous. But this being so, he's just. Now knocking within. He hears the knock. Now are they come. Provost goes out. This is a gentle provost. He's been tested, the provost as well. This is a gentle provost. Seldom when the steel jailer is the friend of men. So he's actually wanting mercy for his prisoners. So this is a gentle provost. This, and by the word gentle here, he's not just talking about his uh, psycholo psychological disposition. He is a man. He's the gentleman. He's the Jean in uh, Latin. He's a, a Christian man. He desires mercy for those under his uh, uh, care in his prison. But how now? What noise? That spirit's possessed with haste that wounds the insisting postern with these strokes. Provost comes in. There he must stay until the officer arrives to let him in. He is called up. And now the Duke. Have you no counterman for Claudio yet? But he must die tomorrow? None, sir. None. And the Duke is shocked at this because he expects that to be the case because the bed trick has happened and he's waiting for Claudio to do what he promised to do, right? To counterman the order to have him executed at dawn. He has not done that. He's in fact given the order to do exactly the opposite. As near the dawning provost as it is, you shall hear more ere morning. The provost, happily you something know, yet I believe there comes no counterman. No such example have we. Besides, Upon the very siege of justice, Lord Angelo hath to the public ear professed the contrary. So he's gone out in public only recently and said that he will be executed. Messenger comes in. And the, the Duke is shocked at the betrayal because he said it not only to uh, the lady, he said it to the friar. 
he's going to give him, show him mercy. He knows this. Okay. And this is his lordship's man. And the duke, and here comes Claudio's pardon. Messenger, my lord hath sent you this note, and by me this further charge, that you swerve not from the smallest article of it, neither in time, matter, or other circumstance. Good morrow, for as I take it, it is almost day. Provost, I shall obey him. The duke, aside, walks to the front of the stage, demonstrates that he is thinking now by speaking in a soliloquy. This is his pardon, purchased by such sin for which the pardoner himself is in. Hence hath offense his quick celerity, when it is born in high authority, when vice makes mercy, mercies so extended that for the false love is the offender friended. Now, sir, what news? So he's learned that uh, mercy doesn't come out of a sinner. Incapable here. The Duke's learned a lesson once again. He needed to be removed from the position. He could not be used as this. The sinner will seek a sinful means of extricating himself. Provost, I told you, Lord Angelo, be like thinking me remiss in thine office awakens me with this unwonted putting on. Methinks strangely, for he hath not used it before. Pray, let's hear. Now he reads the letter. Whatsoever you may hear to the contrary, let Claudio be executed by four of the clock, not eight, but now he pulls it forward, four of the clock, and in the afternoon, Barnardine, for my better satisfaction, let me have Claudio's head sent me by five. Let this be duly performed with the thought that more depends on it than we must yet deliver. This fail not to do your office as you will answer it at your peril. What say you to this, sir? The Duke. What is that Barnardine who is to be executed in the afternoon? A Bohemian born, but here nursed up and bred, one that is a prisoner nine years old. He's not a nine-year-old child. He's been in the prison for nine years. <clears throat> How came it that the absent Duke had not either delivered him to his liberty or executed him? I have heard it was ever his manner to do so. Provost, his friends still wrought reprieves for him, and indeed his face, is, this, his fact, till now in the government of Lord Angelo came not to an undoubtful proof. It is now apparent, most manifest, and not denied by himself. So he'd been pleading for a stay of execution because he said he was not guilty, and, that, and so he'd been going through the process. He's on the execution, he's on uh, the watch for execution, but he has had friends come in and try and bring proofs forward to demonstrate that he was uh, innocent, and now it's clear that he was in fact guilty, and he has admitted it. Okay, so it's now apparent most manifest and not denied. Hath he borne himself penitently in prison? He wants to know the state of his soul. How seems he to be touched? A man, says the provost, that apprehends death no more dreadfully but as a drunken sleep, careless, reckless, and fearlessness of what's, fearless of what's past, present, or to come, insensible of mortality, and desperately mortal. He wants advice. He will hear none. He hath evermore had the liberty of the prison. Give him leave to escape hence. He would not. Drunk many times a day, if not many days entirely drunk, we have very oft awaked him, as it were, to carry him to execution, and showed him a seeming warrant for it. It hath not moved him at all. More of it and on. More of him and on. There is written in your brow, provost, honesty and constancy. If I read it not truly, my ancient skill beguiles me. But in the boldness of my cunning, I will lay myself in hazard. Claudio, whom here you have warrant to execute, is no greater forfeit. Uh, to the law than Angelo who hath sentenced him. So now he reveals. He himself is as guilty as Claudio who is to be executed. He's just exposed it. So he is now revealed. He's made a charge against the monarch or the man standing in the stead of the monarch. So he has exposed himself, the duke here. To make you understand this is in a manifested effect, I crave but four days respite. 
for the which you are to do me both a present and a dangerous courtesy. Pray, sir, in what? In the delaying death. Alack, how may I do it? Having the hour limited and an express command under penalty to deliver his head in the view of Angelo, I may make my case as Claudio's to cross this in the smallest. In other words, I myself will have my head on the Duke's or on the Angelo's platter if I don't do this. By the vow of mine order, I warrant you, if my instructions may be your guide, let this Barnardine be this morning executed and his head born to Angelo. So there is the bed trick, which will be followed by the head trick. <laughs> Let that be the case. Angela hath seen them both and will discover the fact. <laughs> and the Duke, oh, death's a great disguiser. And you may add to it, shave the head and tie the beard and say it was the desire of the penitent to be so bared before his death. You know the course is common. If anything fall to you upon this, more than thanks and good fortune, by the saint whom I profess, I will plead against it with my life. But the provost is now risking his life. Pardon me, good father, it is against my oath. I gave my word. Were you sworn to the duke or to his deputy? To him and to his substitutes. You will think you have made no offense if the duke avouch the justice of your dealing? But what, what likelihood is that? Not a resemblance, but a certainty. Yet since I see you fearful that neither my coat, integrity, or persuasion can with ease attempt you, I will go further than I meant to pluck all fears out of you. Look you, sir, here is the hand and seal of the Duke. You know the character, I doubt not, and the signet is not strange to you. He's got the signet ring of the Duke, and there's his hand. Have you looked upon this before? He has. I know them both. The contents of this is the return of the duke. You shall anon overread it at your pleasure. There you shall find. Now, when I say the hand, I'm holding up the hand. The hand is the handwriting. The signet is the seal from the ring that's on the wax that's in put. It's in this. The contents of this is the return of the duke. You shall anon overread it at your pleasure. Where you shall find within these two days, he will be here. This is a thing that Angelo knows not. For he this very day receives letters of strange tenor, perchance of the Duke's death, perchance entering into some monastery, but by chance nothing of what is writ. Look, the unfolding star calls up the shepherd, referring to the uh, coming of Christ, the shepherds watched by night and saw the star. Put not yourself into amazement how these things should be. All difficulties are but easy when they are known. Call your executioner and off with Barnardine's head. I will give him a present shrift and advise him for a better place. You are, yet you are amazed, but this shall absolutely resolve you. Come away, it is almost clear dawn. Now, um, the, the, the head trick follows the bed trick, and there are a series of substitutions in the plot then. So let, let me just list some of them. Angelo was a substitute for the Duke, right? Right at the outset. He stood in his place. Is Isabella's virtue was a substitute for Claudio's life. She offered it up at any rate. That was the price that Angelo demanded for him to be released. Mariana was substituted for Isabella in the bed trick. Barnardine, the criminal to be executed, was substituted for Claudio, the head trick. Now we'll, we will see, uh, finally, Ragazine uh, will come in for Claudio. But this is a, um, in the, this, this is a strange play. I said the, to you that the critics call this a problem play. It's a problem play because it's, a, it's, it's categorized as a comedy. But it has elements of romance in it, in the sense that it has imp improbabilities about it, I think. Improbable actions. And there's providence that, uh, is behind the scenes that even seem to guide the Duke's actions. So the Duke may be the dramaturge figure, but he himself is not God. And actions and events seem to transpire that seem um, fortuitous. 
or as Shakespeare in his age would say, providential, and allow for him to act upon this if he is being uh, wise in his actions and uh, will act upon the times. So the final substitution is the substitutions of the bodies. Ragazine in four, Act 4, Scene 3, we will find dies of natural causes. Uh, let me see this here and read it to you. The provost enters. Barnardine having spoken to the Duke and so forth, being done his uh, good confession, the provost enters and the Duke says, unfit to live or die, O gravel heart. After him, fellows, bring him to the block. Abbotson and Pompey followed, and now the provost. Now, sir, how do you find the prisoner? A creature unprepared, unmeet for death, and to transport him in the mind he is were damnable for the, for the prisoner. The provost. Here in the prison, father, there died this morning of a cruel fever, one ragozine, a most notorious pirate, a man of Claudio's years, his beard and head, just of his color. What if we do omit this reprobate till he were well inclined and satisfy the deputy with the visage of ragozine more like that to Claudio? So instead of the head trick with uh, Barnardine, we put Ragazine in there. How about if we did that? So substitute for substitute. How about that? This is the provost's suggestion, the man of mercy. The Duke. Comment. Oh, tis an accident that heaven provides. Dispatch it presently. The hour draws on prefixed by Angelo. See this be done and sent according to command, whilst I persuade this rude wretch willingly to die. This shall be done, said the provost, good father, presently. But Barnardine must die this afternoon. And how shall we continue, Claudio, to save me from the danger that might come if he were known alive? Let this be done, said the duke. Put them in secret holds, both Barnardine and Claudio. Ere twice the sun hath made his journal greeting to yon generation, you shall find your safety manifested. Now there's something here. If you've ever seen the Lord of the Rings, the two towers on the third day, it's actually on the fifth day. Gandalf's going to come, the armies over the brow of the hill, right? There's something of that here. There's a darkness coming, and yet there's work to be done, and the time is against him. He has little time. So there's a lot of suspense happening now, and un unheralded, unprompted, and unexpected accidents have taken place that might allow an exit. And I say, we really don't know. At this point, it seems like the tragedy is likely to happen. If you're watching the play, you've never seen the play, it looks like the Duke is going to fail in his attempts to bring about mercy and justice. It's going to fail. And it will be, have been his fault because he put Angelo in that position to begin with. His only alternative is to take his costume off and say, it's me, the Duke. Stop this right now. That's an option. He doesn't seem to want to do that. Why does he not want to do that? If you're Shakespeare and are trying to demonstrate how justice works, why would you not? Like, if you just wanted to stop the execution, he can pull his costume off, say, I never left anywhere. I'm disguised as a duke. He could do that, and he doesn't do it. Why not? What is Shakespeare trying to teach his audience here? Thoughts. Because he could do that. that would, to me, this is an obvious thing to do at this point. Okay, I've tried all my tricks, and there's been a lot of tricks going on here, and I keep failing, and every time I think... I've got it fixed. This Angelo becomes more and more perverse and he seems to be undermining all my attempts to bring good out of evil. More evil is resulting. I've got to stop this right now. Take my cloak off. But he doesn't do that. Why not? Sure. I mean, I'm asking you to guess here and thinking about, yes. Well, if you put yourself in Shakespeare's position, if you're trying to illustrate to the audience how justice and mercy works in this world, because the world's a stage, which is really a stage that is to represent life as it really is. In life as it really is, people don't go around like the Duke disguised, and when things get really bad, they pull their disguise off and they fix everything. It's like the tooth fairy 
you know, and the wand comes out and everything's made right, that he, it would be unrealistic. Now, he could do it in the context of the play, for sure, to stop it, but then Shakespeare would be, would be undermining the purpose of the theater, which is to acquaint us with how life really works and how God works behind the intentions of even those who are pulling the strings, including him, Shakespeare. Is there an element of Jesus being revealed as well? I think so. Well, I mean, that's been evident throughout. I mean, that's part of the measure for measure. It, 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 the, and the substitutionary uh, motif, which has been present in various forms, is strong in the play. It's very strong. And that mercy overcomes all the attempts to orchestrate a just outcome by the human actors, one of whom is actually the dramaturge figure. He is not God. The dramaturge figure is not God. He is, he's been dependent on providence. So at the end of the day, you can't, uh, you're dependent on God's mercy. You can't just bring it about. I think that's what he's illustrating. At the end of the day, you can be as good as you want, do all you can, evil may still thwart you and overcome you, and there might be no rescue that you can bring about, but God can. And that's the whole aim of the play, is to assert God's providence and how he, he brings events that are apparently tragic to a comedy. It's a surprising ending. It's, it, as I say, it's romantic in the sense that it's improbable, quite frankly. So if you're asking for it to be probable, this is totally improbable at this point. Okay, there's a trick and a trick and a trick and a trick, and they keep on new things, you know. It's like, okay, now it's getting a little ridiculous. So it has that element of the romance about it, the improbable. Nonetheless, if it's meant to illustrate how God works in human affairs, I think it works well. So that's my thought at any rate. Um, so uh, Ragazine has died of natural causes, uh, causes rather. Angela believes still that he has slept with Isabella. Why does he break his word actually? That's a good question. He didn't have to. Why did he do it? That's not an explanation. That may be true, but there's usually a motive in it. Like it's, most people have a, a reason for their actions. However bad the reasoning is, they tend to have a reason. So he's going to kill him and break his own word. I mean, he's violating not just the man, he's violating every sense of integrity he has. He already had that. He al he's already lost that by, you know, he's now seducing uh, Isabella. So he's lost all pretense to integrity, but now he seems to be wholly bent on going, digging down, doing his, like, but is that, what's the motivation for it? Is there a motivation? Can we explain sinful motivations? Maybe it's because he fears Claudio and Isabella will combine fo forces and expose him. That sounds like it's a probable one. I'm, I'm speculating, though. It's not told to us in the play. But if there are two witnesses here, she says that he did this. Claudio says, oh, yeah, my sister came and said that the Duke was going to do this. And then he went and he slept with my sister. He can be exposed. Got to get rid of the evidence. That seems the most probable. But he is a scoundrel, of course. But now he wants to bury the evidence of that. So people just happen to die when people in political power who are corrupt are exposed. I can think of a few political figures that this seems to happen to their political enemies. They just happen to show up dead in the dozens. Um, anyway, but he believes he slept with Isabella. Now, there are three fictions which the Duke has created. Uh, the first one was that he disguised himself as a friar, as a holy man. The second was in the supposed death of Claudio. I'm going to call him Claudio. I spent too long abroad. Claudio, we'd say in English. And the third is the fiction of the bed trick. And so here is the, this play is a really interesting play. Like we saw the play within the play last time when we looked at Midsummer Night's Dream. 
Uh, here we see that some characters in this play are just actors, some, uh, and so they act, and they, they, they're not observers, they're just actors. Some actors are also part audience, they observe the action going on. Some seem almost wholly audience, they're just onlookers watching what's going on. And then there's the actual audience itself watching this, and all of these are meditations on what theatre does and drama does because the minds and hearts of the audience are also involved in the drama and as I say the thing that is being judged itself is human nature which they possess themselves. So examples by the way of those who are just actors, Claudio is just an actor, he's an agent here, he does not observe anything. Those who seem to be actors and an audience are Isabella and Mariana. Remember, she doesn't know the truth about the Duke. Or about Claudio's, Claudio's fate. She's going to have to sit and watch it all unfold and be shocked. And then there are those who seem to fit under the position of audience. They are actors in the sense that they do some things, but they are watching more. And those include the, the provost rather and Friar Peter. They seem to be in and they're observing what the Duke is doing in orchestrating it. These are wiser, older figures. They're looking on with approval. Probably represent the nobility in some way, whether they're the clergy or the ar aristocracy. So again, we could see that there are the commoners and then there are the aristocrats. Aristocrats are also being taught how to conduct themselves in all of this, whether they are uh, in the church or in the state. Now, Act 5, which concludes it, and I'm running fast out of time here, uh, recapitulates the whole play, and there are three revelations of the three fictions I just outlined. Three revelations. First revelation, Mariana, not Isabella, slept with Angelo. Secondly, the friar who's been going around is, has, is a disguise for the duke. That disguise is taken off. That fiction has been revealed. And finally, Claudio is not dead as believed, other than by a few insiders from the audience perspective, Claudio is in fact alive. So he's been delivered from death. Now what's interesting here, as I say, Isabel has been tested already and she's been tested severely, I think. Uh, and, and she is in fact the, the most tested figure by the Duke and it's probably fitting on, an, on that note that she ends up marrying the Duke, which is a strange ending, shall we say. But he is seen, and, and I w will suggest that in that Shakespeare's to some extent illustrating and almost Isabella represents virtue and the Duke represents um, monarchical power under God's authority and he's going to marry that virtuous bride, and she represents us. She's almost an allegorical figure at the end that he marries. So it's like a medieval morality play. If you look at the tradition of the morality play, you will find that this happens quite often. It's, it's, it's in the backdrop of Shakespeare's plays. Uh, but it, it, it emerges at various points. But th that's the only thing that explains it, because it's like, why does the Duke suddenly take a shine to <laughs> Like, did he, did he like her from the beginning? Was this a plan all along? Did he see this virtuous young maid who was going to go into the nunnery and then say, you know what, that's a bit of a waste. Let's get her out of there and, you know, I, 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 but well, let me check first of all that she's not just like Angelo, you know, she's clearly younger than him. Let me check that she's as virtuous as she appears to be. And now she's passed all the tests and okay, so you marry me. Well, how about her? She wanted to go into a nunnery. Why should she marry him? Right? Like, what's with that? So it's a strange old ending. It doesn't, it's not very probable. 
and, and again, this is part of the, uh, the fantasy element to me. It doesn't seem very probable unless it's an illustration of some idea of virtue and the Duke wedding himself to virtue, which is really almost a Christian notion. I think it is, in fact, here. But in Act 4, Scene 3, Isabella is told to plead for justice. And uh, she believes that Claudio is dead. And she lies. She says she slept with Angelo. Now she lies because it's part of her role, right? She's doing what she's told. She's acting the part in order to serve the greater good. The audience, are we going to judge her for her lying or are we going to say that there's a sort of a, a role playing here in order to bring out a, a greater outcome? And then in that sense, she's like the Duke who's been playing a role and deceiving. Does God use um, secondary causes, that is agents who are not good to bring about his good means? He does it all the time. They're called people. So in a sense, right? Because there is no good people. There are no good people. If he wanted to use people that were wholly like him and only those people, he would lack people to do it. So he uses sinners. They just happen to be conscious here of the fact that they're, dece they're deceiving. But the purpose is good. And therefore, I think we exonerate her of the blame that we might think she is, uh, deserves. But anyway, um, the enter Isabella and speaking to the Duke here. I'll pick it up. Act 4, scene 3, lines uh, 1, 12 and following. Isabella, ho, by your leave. Good morning to you, fair and gracious daughter. The better given me by so holy a man. Hath yet the deputy sent my brother's pardon? He hath released him, Isabella, from the world. His head is off and sent to Angelo. Nay, but it is not so. It is no other. Show your wisdom, daughter, in your close patience. Oh, I will to him and pluck out his eyes. You shall not be admitted to his sight. Unhappy Claudio, wretched Isabel, injurious world, most damned Angelo. This nor hurts him nor profits you a jot. Forbear it, therefore. Give your cause to heaven. Mark what I say, which you shall find by every syllable a faithful verity. The duke comes home tomorrow. Nay, dry your eyes. One of, our con uh, one of our covent and his confessor gives me this instance. Already he hath carried notice to Aeschylus and Angelo, who do prepare to meet him at the gates, there to give up their power. If you can pace your wisdom, in that good path that I would wish it go, and you shall have your bosom on this wretch. Grace of the Duke revenges to your heart and general honor. So do you just hold off and wait till he comes home tomorrow, and then when the Duke comes home, you expose him. I am directed by you, said Isabella. This letter then to Friar Peter give. But note, so th th this instance here, she is, she is revengeful. Note that the, the response here, she wants vengeance. She wants his eyes out all, you know, that. Because he's not only broken his word, he slept with the substitute. And she knows that, oh, this is a terrible man. And she wants to exact her vengeance. So she's being tested there. She fails the test. But when the Duke, uh, in the guise of the friar, says, be guided by me and just wait your time, she takes that instruction. So she's willing to forbear judgment. So this is a sign of testing and learning again, not immediately taking justice into our own hands. So that's the one instance. The other is in fact Act one, 5, Scene 1 here, right at the outset. And this is when Angelo comes in. Friar Peter comes in and Isabella. Friar, now is your time. Speak loud and kneel before him. Justice, O royal duke, veil your regard upon a wronged. I would fain have said a maid. O worthy prince, dishonor not your eye by throwing it on any other object till you have heard me in my true complaint and given me justice. 
justice, justice, justice. Declare your wrongs. In what? By whom? Be brief. Here is Lord Angelo shall give you justice. Reveal yourself to him. O worthy Duke, you bid me seek redemption of the devil. Hear me yourself, for that which I must speak must either punish me, not being believed, or wring redress from you. Hear me, O oh, hear me, hear. My Lord, her wits, I fear, are not, are not firm. She hath been a suitor to me for her brother, cut off by course of justice. By course of justice? And she will speak most bitterly and strange. Most strange, yet not, but yet most truly will I speak that Angelo's forsworn, is it not strange? That Angelo's a murderer, tis not strange? That Angelo is an adulterous thief, an hypocrite, a virgin violator, is it not strange and strange? Nay, it is ten times strange. It is not truer he is Angelo than this is all as true as it is strange. Nay, it hath it is ten times true, for truth is truth, to the end of reckoning. I guess she's not a relativist. Away with her, says the Duke. Poor soul, she speaks this in the infirmity of sense. And now Isabella. O oh, prince, I conjure thee, as thou believest that there is another comfort than this world, that thou neglect me not. With that opinion that I am touched with madness, make not impossible that which but seems unlike. Tis not impossible, but one the wicked caitiff on the ground may seem as shy, as grave, as just, as absolute as Angelo. Even so may Angelo, in all his dressings, characters, titles, forms, be an arch villain. Believe it, royal prince, if he be less, he's nothing, but he's more, had I more name for badness. <laughs> By my honesty, if she be mad, as I believe no other, her madness hath the oddest frame of sense, such a dependency of thing on thing, as e'er I heard in madness. O gracious Duke, harp not on that, nor do not banish reason for inequality. Just because I speak out of turn, I'm a woman and I'm accusing somebody who's my superior, don't banish reason on the pretense of a social rank. But let your reason serve to make the truth appear where it seems hid, and hide the false seems true. Now with the play is all about this. What is true has seemed false, and what false has seemed true, and let your reasoning guide you through this morass. Those who are appearing good are in fact hypocrites and foul. Those who appear to be wretched and of a lower rank are in fact the good in this. Let your reasoning guide you through all this. Okay, so she comes through, and but note here that she's being played by the Duke. The Duke has asked her to do what she's now just done. And why has he done it? To see what Angelo will do in response to the accusation, which has been made in public. Because now he can't do what he would have done had it been revealed in the absence of the Duke. Because if the Duke had not been there, he would have just said, lock her up and execute her. How will, how will he react? He has the opportunity. He's, she, he has been publicly accused. He's like the, the thief in the prison. What will he do? Well, he's going to try and wriggle out of it. 